Good morning. My name is Iris Ali from ACDC. I'm a transition financial professional that uh, specializes in working with single professional women to rearrange their finances to get you to retire earlier. So, and I'm here with Colette. Hi, everybody. My name is Colette Rava. I'm a residential real estate broker uh, in the GTA, and uh, I help people like you buy and sell real estate. And together, Iris Ali and I make up ACDC, DC. yeah, <laughs> stands for Aris Elliott and Colette. Dynamic, Dynamic change. change, yeah. We're a little bit slow today. Yeah. We're very, very excited today. We have a great topic today that uh, that I think both of us, well, you know, I'm speaking for myself. I'm very excited to talk about this because as you know, yeah. Aris Elliott and I get so excited about real estate, talking about real estate sometimes, and we have a great topic for you today. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, let's get started. So we have been talking about, you know, people buying houses for themselves and buying houses for investing, right? So there's basically some differences that occur. The yeah. first thing that I wanted to talk about is that a lot of home buyers think that when they're buying their home, it's an investment. Okay, this and is where we argue, but we're not yeah, arguing. We're well, debating. We're debating. We have a different of opinion, which is okay. I, I I think you have a very good valid point. But let me show you what by definition an investment means. Yes. An investment is something that gives you money. So you put the money somewhere, whether it's an investment in a portfolio, and it starts generating income. If you do have to pay money to sustain that. And it's not an investment by definition. However, I like to hear what you have to say about a house. Okay. So by definition, you're right. It's just like a business. And sometimes businesses don't make money the first, second, third, even fifth year in business. So if you look at it from sort of more of a loosey-goosey type situation where, and there are investments that you put money into the investment and then you wait. And when you go to sell it, that's when you get your money, mm -hmm. just like a stock or a bond. So it's not generating mm -hmm. money every day, every day, every day. You don't have that money in your hand. So this is where things get a little tricky. So mm -hmm. this is the, the definition. And the other thing too is, yes, when you're a home buyer to live in the house yourself, it's not something that you really want to, uh, it's not the first thing on your mind is saying, okay, this is for an investment. I don't care. So this is why we're going to go through the list. Yeah, okay, let's go through the list. Okay. Um, and just to finish what you're saying, what I do agree on is that if you are able to buy a property, even though it's costing you money every day, I mean, by, yes. by that I mean you have to pay your mortgage, you have to pay utilities, the property okay. taxes, and so on. But it is an investment for yourself, for your right. lifestyle, hey. for... For your lifestyle, for your loved ones, right? Because, you, you know, it, it's better to have your own house if you have a, a family right. that they can enjoy, that you can make some changes and create some memories. So I, I do agree on that point. So well, And the other thing, too, and this is going above and beyond, but let's say you buy a house and there is an investment, like there is a basement apartment. So mm -hmm. technically speaking, it will generate some money if you yeah. rent it. In that case, for sure. Aside from that, we're talking about, I just need a place to live. I don't care yep. about bringing any money. But we really wanted to talk about this because it's so important to have that mindset. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe have a mindset like an investor when you are buying a house. Because every house that I've purchased through my life, I didn't actually, to live in myself, I didn't actually think it was an investment until... It became an investment when I sold it. So mm -hmm. I don't think that makes any sense. But um, let's get started. Let's talk about okay, that. Okay. So let's we have go. Six. Oh, I said 10. Well, how many? So six. six. Okay. We have six. So <laughs> the first one is location, right? Yes. So that is the, as you ever oh, looked at real estate, you always say location, location, okay. location, right? Hold on, hold on, hold on. So Araceli is going to talk about the investor side of it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to talk about the home buyer pure home buyer side of it, mm -hmm. just so you guys can. Okay. Yeah. So tell me about what is the location, how it's a base in your buying a house for yourself. Yes. Yeah, so that's the thing. So with location, 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 we all love saying that because that is the number one rule for any real estate because as a home buyer, you're really looking at the location based on 
let's say you have kids and they have to be in a certain school district or you have family, you want to be near something or especially your work. Every home buyer I work with or that I've, I've, I've uh, helped or even, you know, in the future and, um, you know, past, present and future clients, that's the first thing that we discuss is how far away from work do you want to be or can you manage? Because the further you go out from the GTA, the more bang for your buck usually will bring you. Yeah. So that's what location means to a home buyer. What about investors? What do you think? For an investor, also location is very important because now you are thinking about, not about yourself, but about who your tenants are or who, what kind of tenants you want to have. So do you want to have a little bit more upper middle class tenants or more of uh, the lower income tenants, blue right? Color. So call them blue uh, color. It's a blue collar tenant. So yeah. it depends what you want to do, how much money you uh, have to invest. But it is important to consider uh, where is your property going to be located? Close to malls. Right. Usually this is what we're looking for, especially in an investment property. Yeah. Close to transportation is super yes. important. Yes. Uh, close to grocery shops or malls. It's also very important because a lot of tenants do not have a uh, car or two cars sure. so they want the family to be close to something else right or the purchase see that's the thing too when you're looking at a purchase when you're buying an income property let's just say houses uh parking is very important too so that's something that i just realized now that you know uh with with home buyers they may have two cars or three cars uh somebody when you buy an investment property if you buy a freehold or a townhouse you know, you should at least, and I don't care where you are in the GTA, unless you're like right downtown Toronto, people really desire a parking spot, at least one, right? Mm -hmm. So actually that's a similarity. So let's stop. Let's exactly. Move. Well, it is a similarity, but it's for a different purpose. So, yeah. Okay, good. Okay. I feel okay. better. <laughs> so yeah. the number two thing that investors think, the very first thing is it's all about making money. So you really sure. don't think that, you know, if the property is close by to you or not, it's not really that much of a, an interest, but how much money am I going to make? Do I have to go two hours, three hours, maybe to the U.S. in order to make money, right? Because exactly. that's an investment. That's, right? Yeah, and going back to what we initially talked about, that's the biggest difference, is that this is a money-making opportunity. It's not about, oh, do I like the area that I'm buying in because of X, Y, and Z? Mm -hmm. So that brings the, the whole point to a home buyer it's still about money, but it's more about affordability. They'll say, I have a range from, you know, this, uh, you know, whatever, $500,000 to $600,000. That's my budget. What can you find for me in that range based on my criteria? So they're very specific about that. So that's pretty simple, right? Yeah, that's very, very simple. Yeah. So number three. So we had, uh, if you had a purchase, it's the budget plus your reno. You're always considering your reno uh, and you have a contingency fund because you're not living there. Something right. could happen, right? Right. So they That's what we want. And to make it the most rentable. Correct. And sometimes you also have to think about that extra expense to have a property manager if you're far away because if there's an emergency, you also have to take care of that. Right. So as a homeowner, you don't have to think about that because you are basically the property manager. You can hire somebody to mow the lawn if you really can't do it, if you don't have the time. But more nine times out of 10, uh, okay. the homeowner is not even thinking about that. So that's what we're talking about today is, um, you know, the, the people that are buying just to live there, they don't have an extra budget based on, OK, well, I'm going to walk into a house and, you know, my budget is between whatever, six and seven hundred thousand dollars. And I'm going to keep aside, I'm not even going to tell my agent, mm -hmm. I have an extra $100,000 kept aside for renos. That does not usually happen, in my opinion, when, when it comes to that. Once people start working with me, I ask them and I say, what's your contingency? What, what's your budget for renos? And they're like, what? bro, <laughs> <laughs> they're going to spend all their money on the house and then be house poor. Mm -hmm. They won't be able to find furniture or, you know, maybe they'll, they'll find secondhand furniture or something like that they can afford. But when you, when you start thinking like an investor in this case, mm -hmm. you start having a little bit of money put aside for hiring a painter, hiring a contractor to do a little bit of work. Even you're doing the work yourself. You still need to buy 
materials. Materials, yes, exactly. exactly. Expensive. Yeah, yeah, especially tools. If you don't have those tools already, uh, yeah. I remember th- for the first 10 years of, of uh, you know, my marriage of, of uh, renovating houses, every year I would get a tool for Christmas because I said, hey, yeah. I really like a sawzall this year for my <laughs> birthday. <laughs> That's what I got. And I was very happy with that. It's okay. But these things can add up. So if you don't have that budget, you got to think like an investor. That's right. And this basically the reason that we're doing this is because people are looking to become investors. And we just want to give you the difference as if you have not think, thought about this kind of things that they can prepare you for the future. Right. And exactly. number four, when you're buying as an investor, this is not an emotional purchase. This is just a numbers purchase. How if the many numbers times? work, if the numbers work, then it is a good investment and go ahead and do it. But if the numbers don't work and you just want to buy it because it's a pretty house, I recommend you go back to your numbers always. Right. And that's the interesting thing with home buyers when I when I work with them and I say, listen, don't get distracted by all the shiny bits because the the way the real estate industry is set up. Number one is, uh, I think, I want to say 100% of people find the the house online first, including me. Like, that's how we find listings. I hardly ever these days drive through my neighborhood and say, oh, that house is for sale. Let me go look it up the other way around. So clients tell me, okay, I'm looking for this house in this price, uh, in that budget, in uh, in this area. Mm -hmm. And, you know, how many bedrooms and da-da-da. So I put them on an auto feed and they get houses. So... When you think about the internet and how people find the house first, they the, the main thing of a listing agent is to get people to come to the house. And that is by posting pictures online. If yeah. those pictures look amazing and fantastic, of course, they're going to get more buyers and more views. But if the house looks, that's why staging is a thing, right? But that makes buyers so crazy emotional about the house, even before they've stepped into the house, even before they've seen the street, even before they've learned anything about this house, they see the pictures and they get emotional about it because they picture themselves in the house. Mm. Oh my gosh. How many times have I had that conversation with people? Stop it. (laughs) Don't, don't get emotional. Don't even get emotional until you have the keys in your hand. Even after you make an offer, even after the inspection and all the other clauses are said and done, you, you know, this is still a possibility. Even the same thing with an investor. Of course. I have had houses that they were recalled because of foreclosure. Somebody paid back and it's like, no. Right. You're so close to closing. I know. So So close yet so far. Right. No emotion. Yeah. (laughs) If you can. That's right. So number five, with an investment property, you need to expect that something will go wrong, whether your tenants, you know, if you're going to be dealing with your tenants and don't have a property management, if, if it is only one property and it's close by, I would recommend that you do it so you can get familiar with the problems. Right. Um, and just make sure that, you know, uh, how you manage the tenants and also the little things, because sometimes tenants, they bother you for things that come on, they could fix themselves, but they will do that. So right, right. expect that. Right. So especially with first time home buyers, uh, I actually put in two visits after we, um, you know, make the offer and mm-hmm. the offer has been accepted because there are always I, I don't want to say always, but nine times out of 10, there are, there, there, how about, let's say, let's, you know, not scary. Let's say there can be problems. So never mind, even we're not renovating at this Mm -hmm. point, we're not doing anything just between uh, purchasing and closing. So for example, I had my second visit. I have a closing actually today. Yay. Uh, RNG, I'm not going to say their names, but congratulations, they're closing today, I'm so excited. Um, so they, we, a couple days ago, we went to our last visit, and what happened was we went into the basement, and there's a little bit of water on the floor. So if you were an investor, you would say, oh my God, no problem, whatever, we'll deal with it, it's nothing, because you have that contingency plan. But home buyers, especially new ones, go, oh my God, what do we do? Mm-hmm. It's the end of the world. And yeah. you know, but a lot of the times it's not. And there is something, you know, and that's what I help them through too, saying, 
you know, cool it. Don't worry about it. It's, it could be condensation. It yeah. could be that the house has been vacant for a couple months now. And it's just something that, you know, happens. It's a basement. Yeah. You know, there's a whole bunch of little things too, but it, just to reassure them, it was not a big deal, but it's still a surprise. So things like that, you have to, you know, be, be okay with it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or not be okay with it. Or not be, yeah. Right. And that's the whole point. When you have that second visit so close to closing, then you can talk to the lawyer and say, hey, it's a big problem. What do we do? And then there's always a solution. So don't be scared. Just be prepared. Ooh, I like that. I need a t-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> don't be scared. Be prepared. Be prepared. That's right. <laughs> okay. Okay. That's it. Number six. So investors always think this is kind of thinking to the end product. How much am I going to be selling this property for when I sell it? This Whether your plan is to keep it for two years, uh, for five years, for 10 years, you already know or you are, uh, are predicting what is what you're going to be making uh, at the good. end. So. And also, isn't there like um, amortization? See, I don't know, like with, with other businesses, uh, you know, there's uh, amortization over, you know, a certain amount of time, but also... Um, I'm sorry, I have a brain fart. What do you call that when, when things like, you know, over time, uh, their value lessens? Uh, they depreciate? Depreciate, yes. So depreciation too. So when you think of that, in some markets, yeah, like the actual house will depreciate because it is getting older. And then you have to put money into fixing those things, like let's yeah. say the roof or windows or yeah. the so there is some depreciation. So if you think of it that way as a business, homeowners don't think that way. They think I need heat. I need to fix my furnace mm -hmm. and it's an expense. So on both sides, it's an expense. But when I go to look for houses with people and I say, Hey, or, you know, let's say on the listing side, when somebody yeah. is starting to, to think about selling their house, I say, Hey, why do you love this house? Why did you buy it? So this is the owner telling me why they Yeah, look. that's actually a good question. Right. So either the location or because the big windows bring in so much light. So these are the things that create the sellability for the next person. So, uh, so I always like to look at location too. Sometimes, you know, let's say corner lots. Some people love corner lots. Some people hate corner lots. Mm -hmm. Some people like pools. Some people hate pools because they have this idea in their heads like, oh, it's either too much money. It's too expensive. So it's detrimental, but then other people, especially during COVID, they go, a pool, that's amazing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you never know, but that's the thing. When you think like a homeowner, I mean, if, if homeowners can think that way to think, you know, I love the street, I love the area, the bright windows, the ease of the flow of the interior, like yeah. the sellability things. And that's what a lot of investors look at before they even make the purchase. So, you know. Yeah, the, the, the maintenance has a lot to do. And going back to the corner lot. Yeah. Like if, if, if I'm a homeowner, I have a corner lot, I would not like it that much because there's a lot of maintenance to do. You know, in the wintertime, you have a big area that you need to shovel the snow. Yeah. Uh, it's, a lot, it's a lot to, to do, right? right? However, as an investor, I might like it depends what it is because I can do two entrances. Yes. Right, for if I'm going to yeah. divide the property. So right. it might work in my benefit. So I have two different people in two different areas and they don't have to kind of talk to each other. Right. Uh, and they have their own privacy. So it might work in my benefit. Exactly. So. The other thing too is with investors, if they think of, and especially like, let's even go a bit further to say like busy streets. Mm -hmm. So as an investor, I would love to buy a house or a corner lot on a busy street because they might be zoned for commercial too. Like they'll have dual zoning. So that means I can have a business yeah. and I can have a residence. So I have a plan B if it ever comes to that and I can't rent it as a residence or I could do both. I could have, let's say a doctor's mm -hmm. office, for example, and I have this great location. I can put parking on the side. I have a big frontage, like all these things make a difference when you're looking at a property like that. So uh, yeah, sometimes homeowners, they don't think that way. They really don't want to think about sellability. That has something to do with that as well too. Mm -hmm. Because when you think of, okay, I want to live here, but it's a busy street. And you know, I might have a bus on this street. Yeah. I really don't want to live here. 
But when you go to sell it, if you have that dual uh, zoning or if you have those commercial people yep. saying, I want to buy this bigger property, I'm going to buy your corner lot and the lot beside it and rezone it and do townhouses or something like that, you could really luck out when it comes to selling it. There's no guarantees, right? But it's a nice thing. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> about, uh, about kind of predicting a little bit the future. Uh, and that's how you become an investor just to say, well, mm, this area looks like up and coming. Right. It might be something that is going to happen, especially because remember, an investment I uh, usually try to keep it for at least, at least five years to 10 years uh, to see the big difference. And 10 years into an area, it's a long time, right? Exactly. So a lot of things that can happen there. Uh, you could have uh, schools being made or malls or transportation, anything that could increase the value of your property. So Right. Or, and this is what I tell my homeowners, don't buy on a busy street because you're going to have the noise and you're going to have a hard time. You know, it depends on the street, obviously. Right. But one of those bigger streets to, you know, I, I'm not going to name names, uh, but you know, cause we're all in different areas, but if you buy, uh, so with homeowners, what the best uh, for me, resale wise, just talking about resale, mm -hmm. never mind the idea of thinking, okay, it might turn into dual zoning or things, or if we want to make it into yeah. dual zoning, ideally as homeowners, just homeowners, not investors, I always tell them don't buy a house one street away from a busy street, but two. So two streets away from the busy street, because if there's ever a detour, what's, what do you think everybody's going to go down? Yeah. They're going to go down the first street, not the second one. So there are little, you know, kind of tidbits that I have for my homeowners too, if they have no interest in investing at all in that scenario. But That's a good right, point, yeah. it's not to say that the city's not going to grow every city is going to grow. There's going to be growth everywhere. Mm -hmm. it's how, what you want for lifestyle uh, across the board, all these six things really have to do with lifestyle. As well. correct. Yeah, absolutely. And the thing is, just remember, if you are thinking about becoming an investor, sit down and go through the list and see, have I ever thought about doing this or I thought about it this way? Because, you know, when you get started in real estate, we didn't come up with this now. It's, right. You know, you, yes, can, we you can, well, you can oh, get goodness. started. We and then you, this. Yeah. And then you realize that, oh, okay, so this is what it is. So our, uh, we're passing on our experience has, as investors because we've seen it. I've seen it throughout so many transactions that I've done that it's cool. like, you know, okay, it's like next, next. Right. But the first time that you do it, you're nervous, you're excited, you, there's so many emotions. It's like anything, right? When you're starting new, it's, it's yeah. different. Well, you want, right? you want the best for your family either way. So that's of course, yeah. that if you're regardless if you're buying for your house, but there are just different reasons why. So if you're buying for your house to or buy, buying a house to live there with your family because of the lifestyle you want to create, you want to yeah. be in the backyard, you do want to pull things like that. That has nothing to do with investing. And it's really investing, like Araceli said, investing in yourself and what kind of lifestyle you want with your family. So that's first and foremost, no matter what our list is. Yeah. You know, and and just family. remember that also sometimes people shouldn't buy. And it's not that they shouldn't buy. I recommend that you can, you do it. But remember yeah. to always... Look back at your finances and your lifestyle. I was just going to say that. Go talk to Araceli first, <laughs> and then she'll tell you how much you can afford and what. Because to you know what? Because we get so emotional about buying property. I like this house. Oh, yeah. I like the yard. I like this. I like the the street, the area. That sometimes we just lose track of other things. Sometimes we spend all the money that we have for maybe certain things that we like. We like to go concerts, or we like to do parties or we like to go traveling so there's certain things that also require money and sometimes because of the prices in the gta it's so expensive to right. have a house that you also have to be able to say you know what am i going to be able to do this and also have these other things on the side so it is very important because you can do it only for a short period of time it's kind right. of like a diet right 
you cannot continue on on a diet for a very, very long time. I don't know what you're talking about. If it's very restricted. <laughs> don't start with diets. Come on. That's a whole other topic. I know. <laughs> no, but you're right. You're right. And that's the thing that we just wanted to come out. Life, lifestyle is important. Yeah. And, and, you know, just give you a fun little synopsis of what the difference is between um, investors and, and home buyers, because really there is a really big difference. And, uh, and if you as a homeowner or home buyer can look at it a little bit from the investor side, not mm -hmm. get emotional, really you have a lot of the similarities with budget and uh, those other things too. And maybe, you know, keep in mind a contingency just to do those improvements and stuff. So that's why we want to do it. I hope we, you, you enjoyed this episode. Yeah, that's and great. You, so if, and if you do have any questions or you want to see something else, please let us know. Yeah. Type it in the chat and then we'll prepare something for you for uh, next week. So. And we'll try and make it fun too. So. Yeah. So have an amazing week and we'll see you next Thank week. Thank you. You too. Bye, Bye. everybody.